So we're going to be in Genesis chapter 9, verse 18 through 29. And the title of the message is Just Venting as a Question. And I'm just pre-warning you, I think my wife probably left the room. She was smart to do so. Because <laughs> this one is a tough one. Although it's a serious thing we're going to be talking about, um, I don't want you to be overwhelmed with the message, and I don't want you to be misinterpreting this scripture, and we're going to kind of clear it up um, this morning. So this is my favorite part. Does anybody want to guess why? Because this is where Noah messes up, and this is my favorite part, because it reminds me that the Lord is good, and he's merciful to even those who fail. And that is a awesome message, by the way. Um, but we're now here on the other side of the flood in our text. Um, Noah and his family are now off of the ark. And God's made a covenant with Noah and all of mankind, including you and me, that he's not going to do what he did in Noah's day again. Which, next time he does it, what's going to happen? That's it. It's over. We're done. We've graduated. We move on. And I cannot wait for that day. Uh, so I hope we haven't had rain yet, but I think we might have some rain today, later in the afternoon. So be watching for that rainbow, because it's a reminder that the next time he comes, it'll be an awesome time. Um, but God has given Noah and his family this command to be fruitful and multiply. You remember, he tells them as they get off the ark, hey, this is what I have for you. Go out there, be blessed, but go out and be fruitful and multiply. Grow in the spirit, but actually physically be fruitful and multiply. And from this point on, we will again see that man restores having what we saw in the beginning of Genesis, a sin problem. So, first question, was Noah a good guy? Absolutely. Noah is a really good example of obedience. We've looked at him. Has he not been like the most obedient person with the most unusual circumstances? He's been given some tough stuff, like, hey, I want you to build this boat when there's no rain ever. And not just any boat, but a massive undertaking. And yet, really, does the Bible record Noah complaining or arguing? Nope. He just is obedient. He's, he's a great example to you and I of obedience. But yet, here we are after the flood, and the very thing that caused Noah... To get on the ark and have to have the world destroyed, Noah is going to repeat. He's going to do the very thing that God destroyed the earth for, and that was becoming drunken and being the sinner, being immoral in, in his actions. So although Noah is a great man, he's obedient before the Lord. We know that Noah was, who we saw, we, he's reliant upon God's goodness and his mercy. He's a man who's looking towards the promise of a savior. When he gets off the ark, the first thing he does is he offers a sacrifice to the Lord. And yet, things are gonna go awry, and that's why I love this story, because that's my daily story, and it's your daily story, sorry. So without further ado, verse 18 says, Noah's sons who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. Pay attention to that, by the way. Verse 19, these three were Noah's sons, and from them the whole earth is populated. So, here's a newsflash for you. <laughs> we won't go into science, but the entire world came from these men, who were men and not apes. They came from you. Everybody in this room came from one of these three men on the planet. Now, chapter 10, when we go to the next chapter, it's going to go into the generations of Noah and his sons and how they went down and spread about the earth. And that's really interesting. You should be excited for that if you like geology or the study of the earth and where people went. Uh, really cool chapter, and we'll get into that next week. But you can be sure that the entire world is populated by these three men. They were also being obedient to the command that God had given them. But there's important change that I want you to take note of here if you're not paying attention. As you read this, and on the face value, you might miss it. The building phase of the ark is over. All these men, Noah, his sons, were busy building the ark, 
and that kept their time busy for a long time. They were doing it for 120 years. But that phase is over. The reaching out for the lost in the world and being the preacher, Noah's time as being the preacher is over. Who's, by the way, who's he going to preach to other than his own sons and his son's sons? The being patient and waiting upon the Lord through the middle of this storm, this, this disaster that happens upon the planet, is over. And now we find them on the other side of all this stuff. Everything is now going smoothly for Noah. He's been brought to a new place. The slate's been wiped clean. He's been given a pretty simple command, live life, multiply, be fruitful. In other words, be fruitful in me. Who sees that it's gone from chaos to simplicity here? It's easy in the story to forget it, but Noah was so busy and so in tune with what God is doing. To this point, it's been chaos. And yet now here on the other side of it, we see that Noah <laughs> and his sons have it pretty easy going all of a sudden. Things have calmed down. This is the most important part of the message other than the title. So if you're writing this down, this moment is when you and I as Christians should be real careful. When we get to the spot where we're out of the thick of it, we're no longer in the trial and the tribulation, but things are going pretty smoothly. That, pay attention, is when the enemy wants to strike. He's not waiting to strike you in the midst of your trial. He's not waiting to strike you when you're focused on doing his will and his work. It's when we become complacent. That's when Satan comes in and he wants to cause destruction. And it's, listen, it's easy for him to do. Because Noah's this obedient person. We see him being obedient beyond a lot of people that you can study about in the Bible. And yet when he comes to this side of it, he puts his, he's complacent. He puts his attention to something else and is no longer reliant upon Christ, as, or to, upon God in this case, um, all the way up to this point. Now, I can't go on unless I give you this example, and I was hoping my friend Thomas would be here this morning, but I'm sure he'll hear it, and he's going to appreciate this. <laughs> Some of us in this room, my brother in the back, and me, and a lot of my friends, we were like obsessed with playing soccer. Like, we loved soccer. It was our thing. We liked sports all around, but we loved soccer. And we had this massive dirt field next to our church, and we would go out. It didn't matter if it was 20 degrees outside, if it was 110 outside. You would find all of us boys out there playing soccer every Sunday, every Wednesday, every Friday. We just, that's what we wanted to do. And being a bunch of boys who were playing in the church dirt field, I can tell you this, and my friends can vouch for it, we were not the kindest, nicest children on the planet. We were really rough. I remember one time we decided to try and see if we could get away with playing real football and tackling each other, and we all spent the rest of the Sunday in a row because our parents got angry at us. So we stuck with soccer, but there came a time, and anybody who's been in church your whole life, especially a kid, is gonna understand this statement. There came a time, <laughs> where a boy's worst nightmare happens, and that's when all the moms come out and say, you have to let all your sisters play. <laughs> and I remember all of us boys looking at each other and thinking, this is so messed up. We're gonna have to do things differently. And like the inventive, imaginative boys that we were, we thought, hey, it'll be no thing. This'll be easy. We'll throw them all on one team with the worst boys and then all of us who are good, we'll just womp on them all day long until they don't want to do it anymore. It's genius, isn't it? So here we are. We're getting ready to play soccer out on the field. And I have to go back and say this. Thomas, my friend Thomas, he comes here every once in a while. Me and him were like a team everywhere. We were always on the same team. He was my goalie, and I was the one who either was out there getting the goals. We were like the team. And I remember coming back to my friend Tom, and I went back and said to him, hey, this is going to be a piece of cake. Speak of, speak of him, here he is. <laughs> so I go back to my friend Thomas. Sorry. 
I go back and I say, hey, this is going to be a piece of cake. We got a whole bunch of girls playing. This is going to be no problem at all. We're going to womp on them real quick, and they're not going to want to keep playing. So the first time I go up, I tell them this. I go out to the front, and I remember thinking, all right, this will be easy. I'm going to I'm going to grab the ball. I'm going to go towards this this one of my friends. Her name's Lori Sobdalski. I used to go and run at her, and, and I was going to take the ball and do what I do best. I'm going to juke around her, and I'm going to make her feel this big. So I go, I grab the ball, I go, I juke, and she did what girls do best when playing sports. She closes her eyes and she kicks at the last place she saw the soccer ball, which happened to be my knee. <laughs> I still, to this day, have trouble with that same knee. I have a permanent scar on that knee from that very day, and it has not gone away. And to put insult to injury, I didn't learn my lesson, tried it again multiple times, and other of my girlfriends, young friends, also kicked me in the same spot multiple times. It was the worst experience of my life. Not the worst, I can't exaggerate, but it was a bad thing. I still feel the pain of it today, and that's exactly what Noah is doing here. He thinks he's on the other side, and he thinks this is a piece of cake. God took all the wickedness, my trial, all this stuff is away, and now I can take it easy. I can go about my life and not be concerned of the fact that there is still sin on the planet, and I'm to be a person who cares about it. And Noah was not concerned with it. Verse 20, it says, And Noah began to be a farmer, and he planted a vineyard. He's a farmer. He thinks this is the life. He plants a vineyard and he begins to do this. And verse 21 says, Then he drank of the wine and was drunk and became uncovered in his tent. Now, let, well, I'll come to that. I don't want to be too... Let me start off by saying this. Noah let his guard down. Noah let his guard down and thought, it's all smooth going. If I had a nickel for every time I do this in a day... You know, I get up and I think, oh, cool, Lord, you've done great things with me yesterday. It's usually Monday, by the way. I don't know why it's a Monday, but it's always a Monday for me. I'm on my high here at church. We learn. We're, we're just going through it together. At least I'm going through it. Uh, I've been up for very long amounts of time. I've been studying. I've been in the Word. I'm ready to come here and do what God has asked me to do. And then come Monday morning, I think, we've, we've finished it. It's good. And then I go to work, <laughs> and I fail horribly. And that's the thing that Noah does here. He lets his guard down because he's not taking sin seriously. He's not keeping his guard up and staying going forward. I remember when my parents said, hey, we're about to move. And we had lived here our whole lives and we were going to move. I remember saying to my dad, why would you do this to me and rip us out of this place? And his answer to me, his answer, which still I, I understand it now, but it, it just rings in my head. He, he said, because here we've become complacent. Interesting, Because my dad said, whenever you become comfortable, you better be careful. Because that's when you're not being effective for him. And you're falling into this place where you're vulnerable to sin. Now I have to address something here. Because all the teachers out there are saying or teaching that this has to do with a homosexual story here. And I don't agree with that. The implication of your text says that Noah, he... he is in his tent, he drinks of the wine, he becomes drunk. Who in here has drank before? All right, so everybody is knowledgeable about what happens when you drink and how you behave when you drink. And he becomes uncovered in his tent. And this word uncovered really emphasizes his sexual immorality, Noah. It emphasizes that he did it in his own sexual desire to expose himself. So I don't want to pick on this, you know, the Lord, I was like, should we talk about this? And the Lord kind of laid it on my heart to, to say this one scripture here and move on. But if you have trouble with drinking or you're a Christian and you're doing so, look, and I'm not going to stand here and, you know, cast fire down from the sky for you. But Proverbs chapter 20, verse one says, wine is a mocker. Strong drink is a brawler. And whoever is led astray by it is not a wise person or is not wise. And I'll leave that where it is. Because I, I, you know, what, you know, it's a debate that goes on in church. Is it okay? Is it not okay? I'm going to leave that verse right there. 
But that's just one verse. There are many more, that, and I encourage you, go see what the Bible has to say about drinking. Every, of the, every one of the verses leans in that direction of Proverbs, that it says it's not a wise thing to do. And why? Somebody tell me why. What does it do? It takes and it puts your guard down. It's a depressant. It causes your spirit to be depressed, to, to do things that you would not normally do. What is Noah doing here? Before he drinks, he's letting his guard down. This intensifies it. And what comes from this is the wickedness of his heart comes to the surface. And you think, well, Noah's an obedient, good guy. Absolutely. He's a great example. But in every person, at the bottom of your heart is wickedness. Terrible wickedness. And it will rise to the surface if you're letting your guard down. It's not something to take lightly. And Noah takes it lightly and he messes up here. And oh boy, how I'm happy he messes up here. Here's the thing. Did Noah mean to get drunk here? This is a challenging question, and I'm going to tell you that the answer doesn't matter. Whether he meant to fail here or he didn't mean to fail here doesn't matter. He's still the sinner. He still is in an inappropriate place. It's undeniable that Noah is not where he should be. He's doing something contrary to what he knows to be correct. And you say, well, he doesn't know he's drunk. Well, you just wait till your text goes ahead because you're going to find out he knows exactly what's going on because your text says that he knows. But either way, when a woman or man becomes drunk, the outcome is not going to be good. Alcohol is a depressant. It loosens people because it depresses their self-control. It depresses their wisdom. And it, de it depresses or warps their balance and their judgment. And that's a scary thought because that is the opportunity that Satan is looking for to cause you to fall. That's what he's looking for when you'll put your guard down. So Noah lets his guard down. He falls into this sin, which I call the shady position. And I love this about Noah. He doesn't just fail, but this is like an epic failure for him. To me, it's like it's not like, oh, Noah lied or Noah. No, this is ultimate. Because you find Noah being this massively obedient, good person, and then all of a sudden he's naked in a tent, drunk, being immoral. And he ends up exposing himself, and whether it was accident or purposeful, it doesn't matter. But Noah finds himself in a situation I guarantee you he does not want to be in. Who in here is drinking or drank and found yourself in a situation you did not want to be in? All right, cool. <laughs> There's a lot of us. That's what will happen to you and I when we get comfortable, we start to let our guard down and not take this world seriously. You know, I was with a pastor yesterday, and, and, and this is a big deal, you know. I, I go around, and I, I find a whole bunch of Christians who are in this mode. Their guard's down. They don't really care about the wickedness that might creep in. They're not busy about his business. They come here every Sunday. They sit in a pew, and then they go home, and they live nonchalant. That's not how you and I can live. Because if we do so, the enemy will come in like Noah and we'll find ourselves in these situations. Who thinks this is a good place to find yourself? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> this is a terrible thing that he's, he's in. And it's bad, but let's read on. Verse 22 says, And Ham, the father of Canaan, stop again, he repeats himself. Is that interesting to you, by the way? Why does he keep repeating this? It talks about all three sons, but it keeps saying him, the father of Canaan. Let's keep going on. Saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. So there are teachers who are trying to make this into a sexual thing, and it's not. Ham comes in, and your text, when you interpret these words, says he enjoyed it. It was something he enjoyed. He walked in and saw his obedient father, who's doing this great thing, it, it, it pleased him to see his father in a lowly state in sin. He enjoyed this. That's what your text is telling you. Which this is odd, okay? I mean, like, why? Why would, as a son, if I saw this about my dad, I would not come out being like, yeah, he's a loser. But your text says that Ham comes in and he sees the nakedness of his father 
which is mistake number one. He looks upon his father for the mistake. On someone else, he's looking for a mistake. And he enjoys it when he finds it. And then the second thing is, he goes, it says, outside and tells his two brothers. I'm telling you this, that any preacher who's preaching it other than this is torturing the text. You know, this is what I love about preaching the Word of God. I don't have to take it and turn it into my own story to, to understand the consequences that come from this story. And pastors are trying to get around it. I'm not going around it. We're going to talk about this very thing because it's a hard hurdle to get over. I'm warning you. Okay, what's happening here is... That teachers want to take this and say, oh, well, something sexual happened in the tent. No. They only say that because they can't argue off what's about to happen from this moment. They can't get over the hurdle. And I'm going to talk about it, and we're not going to hop over it. But what's going on here is that there's two mistakes done. Mistake one, he walks in, and he's looking for someone else's sin, and he's enjoying it. Mistake number two, he leaves that place. And wants to let everyone know so he can destroy his father's character. That's what he's trying to do. Here's the two problems that he has. He delighted in his father's mess up. Now, I'm going to warn you, and this is such a, you know, I, you, don't, you don't think I would have to stand from the pulpit and say this, and yet we all do it. Who in here has delighted in someone else failing? Hey, good, man, you guys are on it today. Everyone's raising their hands. It's pretty cool. I was really scared that I was going to be the only one raising my hand. <laughs> Ham comes in, he sees a person that he is not okay with. Ham is not cool with his dad. By this story, you know Ham is not cool with his dad. And he sees his dad in this broken place. By the way, all of you have been in a broken place similar to this. He sees his dad in this broken place, and he, he, he enjoys it. it. He finds delight in the fact that someone else is failing, and he finds pride in it. Listen, if, you are, if that describes you as how you behave, when you're looking at someone else that you know is saved, and they fall into sin, and you have this attitude, you ought to be real careful. You better reel it back because the consequence that comes from this is huge. And that's why pastors want to take and readjust the story so the, so the consequence matches the sin. They don't want to realize what the real sin is here. And it's simply pride and arrogance and looking at someone else's sin and finding delight in their failure. <coughs> These are my, my notes. This is a sickening heart for a follower of Christ to have. I mean, do I need to repeat myself there? This heart is so sickening for a Christian to have. If you have not love, you have nothing. If you are missing love, Jesus says, you are missing everything. Oh. The original text implied that Ham looked upon his father with intensity. That's what it actually translates to. He's looking at this situation of failure with intensity. He loves it. He's soaking it in. He enjoyed to see someone else fail because his desire was to ruin that person's reputation however he could and make himself feel better about his own position, his own sin. And I'm telling you right now, they go hand in hand. If you're someone who is out there looking at another Christian's life and you're delighting in their failure, it's because you have as much failure as that person and you're looking to justify yourself. That's a tough thing, man. You know, I, I, I am so grateful I can stand before you today and, and tell you that my mom and my dad taught me, do not be that person. It's hard. I tell you this, in this world, it's hard. But you know, I've stuck with that. If there's one good quality I think that has been retained in me, it's to love the unlovely. And I find myself still doing this very thing, looking upon someone else and trying to use them to justify myself. And 
he doesn't just end it with this ability that to, to, to let pride rise in himself, to justify himself. Now he goes a step further and he begins to gossip. He goes out and he begins to gossip. Verse 23, but Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders and went backwards and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away and they did not see their father's nakedness. Now I'm going to have to borrow from John Corson here because no one preaches it the right way that I have heard except John Corson and I had to borrow from it. Shem and Japheth, they go on to become the nations of the world that you see today. Ham does not, I'm going to repeat myself here, pay attention, Ham does, Ham does not, he goes on and he is wiped off the face of the earth. Him and his race are wiped off the face of the earth. And I have to preface that because next week there are a lot of people teaching that Ham was the father of black slavery. And that is so, I, we won't even go into that. I can't believe that that's even being spoken about. Because had you read your Bible, you would know Ham is the father of Canaan. And Canaan was the, the group of people who God wiped off the face of the earth because they were so wicked and came against Israel. And so we won't go there today. Well, that's for next week. But Shem and Japheth go on to, to supply the earth. So here's a newsflash for you. You didn't just come from Ham, Shem. And Japheth, you came from Shem and Japheth. So these people go on and they, they multiply and they fulfill the task that God has given them to do. They succeed. And I think that this heart explains why. Because when they begin to hear, stop. What's the first thing that happens? Shem comes out of the tent. He comes out. He goes to these two men, his brothers. And what does he do to them? He gossips. What do they do? This is a very uh, weird thing because you'll hear a lot of times, and I think I've even preached it, that when you hear gossip, shut it off. Don't even listen to it. I'm going to have to retract that statement because Ham, Sh or Sham and Japheth, they sit here and they hear it. They let it stop with them. That's the key. They hear it, and it stops with them. They're not going to go around and say, you're right. Wow, what a stupid idiot. And they're going to go talk to someone else. But no, they do this really significant thing. They, they go to see if it's true first. Shem and Japheth are going to see if it's true is what you would first come to the conclusion, correct? Incorrect. They don't even go to find out if whether it's true or not. They go to the tent where he's at and they put a cloak on themselves and listen, they won't look at him. They're not going to turn around and look at him in his place. Why? Is that weird to you? You know, it's weird to me because I'm clumsy and I'd probably end up tripping and then hurting people. But it's weird because... They don't want to see their father in that state. Why? Because it will corrupt their view of their own father and they're not interested. Can you say that when gossip's being said to you? That you're not interested in knowing someone else's garbage and looking upon it. Seeing if it's real because you don't want to corrupt your view of that person. Can you say that this morning? Don't raise your hand. No one in this place raise your hand. This was such a hard thing for me to read. They take a garment, they put it over their shoulders, and I love this because it's a covering for their father's mistake. They go in and they put it over their father so that not even they see it. And you say, well, that's hiding sin. Absolutely not. It is very important that the Christian understands the, the importance of having a right heart towards all around you. And if you're looking at people's problems, if you're looking at their wickedness, the gossip about them, which, by the way, is probably 80% of the time not true. It didn't matter to Shem and Japheth whether this was true or not. Maybe their father was completely covered and not the sinner. They still would have went in backwards, put a covering on him, and went about their business. Why? Why? Someone tell me why from the audience. I'm ready for an answer. 
because they were concerned about not destroying their father in the process and not having a hard heart towards him. That's what it's about. That's why they do it this way, which is odd to me because we don't do it that way. When someone gossips, the first thing you do is what? Usually the first words out of my mouth are, oh, wow. Or something of that effect, who knows? And then the curiosity wants to find out, is it true? Why? Because my heart's intent is to find wicked in other people so I can feel better about myself. That's a scary thought. Because it isn't about feeling better about ourselves. It's about making sure that we're being, you know, the Bible tells us that love covers a multitude of sins. Love covers sin. And what you see from Shem and Japheth is love for their father. They don't want to destroy his character. They know he's probably in this state. They don't care. They're willing to cover it up and wait until he's to a place where they can deal with it. But they're not looking to find something in their brother and, or sister in Christ and hold it in their own heart. That's a dangerous thing, and we're going to delve into this a little bit more. But looking, this is John Corson, looking upon someone's sin, it destroys the way that you and I view them in the future. No doubt. You know, I understand this probably better than most people in this room, because when I sin, everyone remembers it. Everyone remembers it. And it's been that way my whole life for some odd reason. When you're the pastor's kid, everyone remembers it. Everyone brings it up. When I mess up, everyone brings it up. And it's not like, hey, once a month someone's going to do it. It's almost every day that I deal with people. Someone's going to bring up something that I have done in the past that they've either heard I've done or they've watched me do. You know what it does to a person? Let alone what it does to them. Do you know what it's doing to you? That's the hard part. It's causing your view of people to be strewed. It's not, it's not a good thing. It means that you're going to behave differently towards that person, even if you don't try to. Because you now have something in your heart about them, and it causes trouble. Verse 24, so Noah awoke from his wine, and he knew what his younger son had done to him. He knew what had gone on in this moment. Then he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, he shall be to his brethren. Now wait. Put on the brakes for a second. Hold up. What is being said here? Noah comes out. He realizes Ham, his son Ham, has come into the tent and seen him and enjoyed it, found delight in his demise. And he knows that he went out and gossiped because here comes two of his other sons to cover him. He knows exactly what has transpired. Ham has been a very terrible person. What is the curse that he says? Cursed be whom? Okay, why on earth? Here's the question. Why is Noah cursing Ham's son and not him? Here's a challenge. I just had to sit here and think about this for a minute. And you know what? A lot of commentators don't know. They cannot come to a conclusion. I'll tell you this. I do not support, nor does the Bible support, generational punishment. God is willing to work with any generation who will turn to him. Any generation, any person. You're like, my father was a drunk and so shall I be. No. You have a choice to walk with Christ and have a new life. There is no generational curse. That's an excuse so you can continue in your wickedness. Hands down. Are you more vulnerable to sin because of generations? Absolutely. Absolutely you are. Here's the thing about God, and this is a scary thought if you weren't thinking about this. He knows the hearts of all men and women. He can look in your heart and he knows how you feel about things. He knows where you're at and he knows what you're doing. And the irony here is that he doesn't... This is a harsh punishment. Let me just say what's going on here. This is a really harsh punishment because for him, it's not just him who's being punished. He is being punished because now his son is being punished also, which when you study Cain, Canaan, 
you realize his son was over 9,000 is a term we use as young people. Over 9,000 like his father. He was ridiculous. He and his offspring were defiant against the Lord. And God knew that Canaan was walking in the ways of his father. He knew that Canaan had the same heart as Ham. And he sends, by the way, this is a prophecy that Noah is speaking. He's prophesying of what's going to happen in the future. And he's saying, Canaan, your son, is going to, to, to be a servant to the rest of the people. And he kind of spares him because he didn't tell him Canaan and his generations would be wiped off the face of the earth. God's sparing him that. That, but that's a harsh judgment, in my opinion. Who thinks that's a harsh judgment? Okay, one, two, two of you, three, a half, two and a half. That's a harsh judgment to me. I want you to pay attention. Who in here is a parent or a grandparent? Raise your hand. Good. And I say this from the pulpit a lot, but I'm going to bring it a little more real to you. How you behave, how you act, how you handle situations is exactly how your kids are going to do it. They're just going to. The great qualities that my mom has, I, I exemplify them. Probably more sometimes. The bad qualities that she has, I also pick them. Same with my father. It wasn't their words. Yes, but what mattered is how they lived. That's what mattered. I saw them serve Jesus. I'm serving Jesus. It's important to understand that as a parent, but here's the scariest part, and I have to throw myself out here for you all to see, which is what I have to constantly do. This is hard for me to hear. It was hard for me to study this because I am so guilty of this. Listen, dad or mom, it could be mom, but dad most importantly. If you're going to work every day, are you gonna see stupid stuff? Are you gonna have a rough day a lot of times? Yep, you sure are. And then you get off work and you think, wow, that was a doozy. And you drive home, you get home, you walk in the front door and you go to your wife and you say, let me vent. I gotta vent on you. How many times does that happen in a week? Why are you smiling? You're supposed to answer. Way more than it should. You come home, you begin to vent. This guy did this. He did this. You're not going to believe this. And then I had to do this, which is tearing someone down and then praising myself. And I repeat that process with everyone who's had an insult or something for me for the day, who's wronged me or wronged themselves. And I pour it onto my wife and I think, I feel better about myself. I'm good. I can continue to go forward. Who sees a problem with that? Well, first of all, there's a problem for me. Because I am like him. I am the guy who is now taken and torn other people down and enjoyed it. And I'm telling you, enjoyed it to feel better about myself. You think Ham's so wicked, he's obnoxious. Now, why would you do that? You we do it, I do it. That's not the punishment. I get off and I feel great and I go back to my job and I repeat the process again. Okay, here's the kicker. My wife now has a shrewd view of everyone that I speak about. Do I need to repeat myself again? The one whom I thought was helping me is now the person who's going to suffer more than me. Because I've taken my views and my heartaches and, and poured them out upon someone else. I've gossiped. And I've made it so that she now has a misconstrued view of the people around me. My kids hear me do it from time to time. I remember one time I was talking about this particular individual who was very difficult. And I had all rights to talk about it, or so I thought. I began to speak about him, and I remember my son sitting in the room. Sorry. 
and saying, oh yeah, that guy? And I had to stop and think, what am I doing? Because now my son doesn't even know this person and he already hates this person. What am I doing? Listen, the consequence may not be you. You may go on and continue to be him and have this attitude, but the consequence will fall on those you gossip to. Those who are looking up to you for guidance will be the ones who pay a consequence because you're training them to be what you are and worse. And Canaan goes on to be way worse, I'm telling you right now. His descendants go on to be way, it just keeps going. It doesn't know at no point does anybody put the brakes on and turn back to God. Does anybody see the seriousness of it now? Listen, if you're a Christian and you're out there and this describes you, hopefully it does, and I'm not the only one. Words come out of your mouth, shut your mouth and take it before the Lord. Be someone who's ready to say, you know what? I'm gonna go in backwards and I'm gonna put a cloak on all of those people who wronged me. Is that hard? Yes, very. And it makes you understand how great Ham, Shem and Japheth are for doing what they did. This is a tough thing for you and I to do on a daily basis, and it wasn't even a thing for them. They didn't even want to go this direction, to look upon someone else and know their wrongdoing. And you say, well, I can't help it. I go to work, and I just see it all. I can't get away from it. I know. I'm there every day. I understand what you're saying. But it has to die there. It has to die at work. And when you come home, you know, it's a good thing we drive far here. Wherever you work, you don't have a choice. Sorry. You have to drive far. Unless you're lucky. Noonie. She gets to work close by. <laughs> Some of you get to work close by. A lot of us don't. But you know, it's a blessing. Because it means when you get in the car, you have a choice to say, Lord, I'm handing all of these things to you. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be the one who loves the unlovely when they're messing up. Man, do I struggle with this, not only in my own life, but watching it happen in the church around me. And I mean right around me, and I'll leave that there. Verse 26, he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and may he dwell in the tents of Shem. May Canaan be his servants. I love this because um, I'm a brother who loves, like unconditionally. If there's one thing I was taught by my parents is to love my brothers unconditionally, no matter what they've done to me. I, my brother, I remember one time, you know, we're cleaning the room and he got really angry at me. Not this one, you're safe. <laughs> and he decided, you know what? I'm angry at my brother, so I'm going to try and bite his belly button off. And he, he got me good. And I didn't touch him. In fact, when it was all said and done, I remember, it's cool, man. Don't worry about it. That wasn't spawned from me, by the way. It's not because I'm a great person. It's because my parents taught me to have that attitude towards my brothers and my sisters. And I've kept that attitude. I don't know how, but I have. But I love this because right here, in this prophetic blessing on his two sons that did the right thing, there's unity. He says of Shem, hey, your, Canaan is going to be your servant. You'll go on and you'll be great, but he's going to be your servant. But then he goes on and says something odd. He says, Japheth, he's going to enlarge him. He's going to make him great. Now, there's a prophecy in this that blow your mind because Shem, Shem is the father of whom? The Arabs and the Jewish people. He's telling them, blessed be the Lord of the God of Shem and may Canaan be his servant. That's going to come true, by the way. But here's the great part. Who's, who's Japheth? Who's from Japheth? Raise your hand. Unless you're Jewish, raise your hand. He will dwell in the tents of Shem. Listen, there is no room for anti-Semitism in the Bible, by the way. Sorry. If you're a Christian and you're an anti-Semite, you're not a Christian because your Bible does not speak that. Japheth will dwell in the tents of Shem. Through the Jews, you and I have salvation. Through them, we have salvation. And we can dwell together in unity. I love that. That's a picture of all of time and one little thing that Noah says to his sons. But listen, if you want to go on and dwell in unity, you and your brother, 
you got to be people who do these things. You can't be the ones who are gossiping and tearing down for your own benefit. Because then you create disunity in the church. And that's not in these two brothers. They're told, you guys are going to dwell and it's going to be good. You know, it's funny how history literally proves it. Japheth dwells. It, it, we, we've stuck together, the Jews. Well, I mean, there's some people who haven't. But ultimately, we've stuck together in this sense. America is still standing for them today, surprisingly. In the end, no one will. Just the Lord. But in chapter 10, we'll look at the descendants of Noah through his sons. It goes down and we get to study all these things and they're really cool. And verse 28 says, And Noah lived after the flood 350 years, so all the days of Noah were 950 years and he died. And you're like, what does... That's a terrible way to end it. We're just, you know, hearing how old Noah was and that's it. Listen. Noah went on to live a great, wholesome life. He's the oldest person past him. No one else gets to live as long as him. He's the last one that lived into the 900s. Which tells me you can fail and still be blessed by the Lord. It means that God still honors you even though we make mistakes. And so you're saying like, well, if I gossip or if I end up doing that, listen, God has mercy and grace and he'll continue to move you forward and bless you. But you have to have the heart of Shem and Japheth. That when you do mess up, you're ready to go back and say, no, nope, no, we're not doing this again. Lord, help me to be someone different. This whole message gives me hope because I'm just letting you know I mess up a lot. A lot, a lot. As a pastor, I mess up a lot. I preached a message on Thanksgiving and being thankful last week. And I was not thankful this week. I was the worst person this week. And by the end of it, I just had to look at Aaron and say, I failed us. I've done horrible. But God has mercy and grace. And then I go back and say, all right, Lord, let's try it again. Let's, let's be thankful. Listen, gossip is not an easy thing to overcome. I'm going to tell you that right now. And you're not just going to poof, stop doing it. But if you know that's you... If this description is you, you cannot become complacent about it. You cannot go into coast zone and think, I'm just going to coast along and what happens, happens. You and I, that is when Satan is right to come in and destroy your life. To cause you to become a person who falls back into sin over and over again. So there's hope in this message, and I'm really excited to give it to you today because here's the thing. God desires that we have the heart and the desire to be obedient. He'll produce the obedience in his time. But if you lose the desire and become complacent, you'll find yourself being just like him, and you'll end ultimately with Canaan. You're like, I don't know, that's pretty far. Trust me. I'm going to stand before you today and tell you that half of my friends are in Canaan's land. They grew up in church, they were taught these things, but they became complacent, me being one of them, and went out and began to be wicked and do the things of the world and abandon what we were taught to do that's right because we became complacent. We didn't take sin seriously. And some of them are still out there, but I'm telling you, some of them are here this morning. Some of them are listening online. And for those of you that have, hey, I'm gonna tell you, good job, keep going. <laughs> For those of you who are not, and I know they listen also, you know what you're supposed to do. Come back to the Lord and ask him to be gracious and merciful. Go back with that heart of saying, you know what, I don't want to be this anymore. I want to be something different. If you're suffer suffering from alcohol, don't be that person who continues in your complacency. Take it seriously. It's important. Because if not, your future, not just your future, but those around you, will be affected by it and it ends in a sad story and it does for him and for Canaan it ends horribly for them and I'm not going to stand up here as the preacher and tell you that sin has no consequence listen if you're going to sin by all means you have that choice but if you do it you'll do it to your own demise and you can quote me you will do it to your own demise you will end up like Canaan if you continue in sin if you repeat it and practice it you're becoming someone like Canaan and you'll begin to try and justify your own works and you'll tear everyone down on your way out to do it. Trust me, I've done it. So with that being said, this goes on. We get to 
it, this book gets better and better as I read ahead. I'm like excited. I want to jump ahead. But we're going to the Tower of Babel, which is, wow. What a, what a, there is so much to learn in the next two chapters. Talking about Nimrod, a picture of the Antichrist. What a timely message to give soon. Then we go on and we get to go next to Abraham. And wow, man. Those are some really cool stuff that we get to move into. And I know that God's doing a great thing. I know I want to share with you that this message is going out farther and farther and farther. My time's becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. But God is using this fellowship to reach a bunch of people. And there's powerful things going on outside of these walls just from this right here. But that also, and I wanted to just give you guys a heads up, it requires a body, a, a body of believers to be on their knees about these things. This is where, this is the planning room. I call it the planning room for the war that we're in. We come here and this is where we learn to be like Christ. This is where we learn and get motivated to get out there and get busy. But ultimately, as a group, we have to support one another. So I'm going to ask you this week, be in prayer for all the people who this is affecting. And it's a lot of people, a lot. If I could tell you the stories of what I know, it would blow your mind how much this teeny little church that seems insignificant sometimes when we come here is not insignificant. God's using it very mightily among the world. Uh, and it doesn't start from how great we are, how much money we tithe. None of that is, is what matters. What matters is a bunch of people taking the word of God seriously and following it and watching the power of Christ. And it does work, I'm telling you. So you know what? If you're sitting there and you're listening and you're struggling with any of these things, don't be disheartened. This is not a message to tear you down. It's a message to build you up and, and get you to understand that it is easy to follow Jesus if you'll just give him the chance. You say, well, I'm suffering. I'm the gossiper and I can't stop. You absolutely can through the power of Christ. You can. I'm an alcoholic. I have trouble with it. You can overcome it through the power of Christ. You cannot do it any other way. You'll fall right back into it. And guess what? At the cross, you find mercy and grace. At the, at the foot of the cross, when you've messed up, you can find grace in your time of need. Come boldly before the throne of grace that you might find help in time of need, it says. I'm going to leave it right there. Lord, we thank you so much for your word and its impact on our lives. We also thank you, and this is an odd thing to thank you for, we, we thank you that it dives into our troubles and brings them to the surface. Sometimes, Lord, it's hard to put it out there and say, that's me, I'm the sinner. And yet that's what you want. Your word says, confess with your mouth before men, and I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. Lord, we want to take these sins and these things in us that we find as we read your word, and we want to lay them at the foot of the cross. Lord, like Noah, we desire obedience, but we mess up. So we come back to the foot of the cross, Lord, and say we need your grace and your mercy. But at the same time, I ask, Lord, that those of us in here who this message is hitting home, you would develop in us in obedience, the desire to be obedient. Lord, we want to have our lives changed. We don't want to just go through this life complacent, but we want to be in your will, Lord, in your work, in the fight. We don't want to be sitting off on the sidelines enjoying ourselves. Lord, we desire to follow after you. So build that desire in us. And I pray, Lord, that those who are listening online who may not know you, Lord, they're watching this and they don't know you. I pray that you would continue to have the Holy Spirit speak to their heart and keep drawing them to yourself and give them an opportunity, Lord, to come to you. We thank you for all the work you're doing here in this church. We thank you for all the work that you're doing outside of this church. And Lord, it's not us. It's all you. And we just have the same heart we have every Sunday, Lord. We just ask Please use us. Send us into it. We just desire to be what, whatever you're doing. We want to be a part of it, Lord. We don't want to be on our own, doing our own thing, but we don't want to be complacent. We just want to be in your will and part of your plan. We're waiting for the day that you take us out of this world. But until that day, I ask, Lord, that we would be busy about your business and being changed into your image. In Jesus' name, amen.